thanks for taking the time to talk to us this morning here on talk radio i, I was just saying that I, I think it's even for me i didn't know any of the victims i've just been someone who has been an onlooker to this story but i I have to choose my moment to watch that drama because I think it's going to be utterly infuriating mm. to experience and to see dramatised the horrific police failings that mm. led to um, the subsequent murders which um, took place as a result of the police not taking the, uh, the initial murders seriously. Um, it, it must have been... Have you watched it yet yourself? Yes, they showed it to me um, about two years ago. We've had, there's been a delay in it being broadcast because we've just had an inquest into all the police failings. Um, so they showed it to me about two years ago and I have watched it go out this week as well. And how does and, it make you feel being someone who knew one of the victims? Um, the, do you mean the drama? I mean, watching the drama, I feel, um, watching the reaction to it, seeing how enraged people are um, is, is gratifying on one level because I've kind of, it's something I've lived with for about the past seven years. Um, but it also angers me because throughout this, I feel, like I've, I feel like I'm connected to the other families and the drama does an excellent job of showing something of what they went through and how badly they were treated. And I was a friend of Gabriel's. I only knew him for about six weeks. And I feel like I've been through a lot, but it, it pales in comparison to what the families have gone through. And um, you'll see in the drama, I mean, essentially because of police incompetence or indifference, we were all left really to do our own investigations. And certainly, you know, what all the families did, but the, the final family, the Taylor sisters, I've, I've no doubt that they saved lives because of what they did. Because I think what people don't realise is that the first... So, so Stephen Paul was meeting these young men from, from dating apps and um, the first victim, Anthony Walgate, met him, drugged him, overdosed, killed him. Then... Um, reported it but changed his story and moved the body which the police knew about but mm. they released so he was charged with perverting the course of justice but wasn't charged they didn't see it as suspicion uh, and a murder itself he was charged with with not being honest in the circumstances in which the body was found they then released him on bail and that was when he was able to then go on and kill Gabriel, your friend. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's all the, it's so hard to convey all the failings that the police made. Uh, the drama does an excellent job of getting to some of it, but it, even the lengthiest news article won't be able to cover all the failings, inexcusable failings. Um, it takes an eight week long inquest to go through all of those. I mean, when you talk about a serial killer, I think it conjures up in people's minds an idea of, you know, some sort of criminal calculating genius. But Stephen Port was anything but that. He's an absolute moron. He was leaving the bodies on his doorstep, three of them in the same area of a churchyard. Yeah, they were they were months. they were found. Um so then Gabrielle and Daniel Whitworth, the third victim, were found mm. in the St. Margaret's, was it St. Margaret's churchyard? And he put a note on his third victim's body to say yeah. that he killed Gabriel, the second victim, and that he'd killed himself. It was suicide. And they never even checked with the family, did they? That the note was genuine or that the note was in the handwriting of, of, of uh, uh, the third victim, Daniel Whitworth. Well, uh, so important to be factual, what they did was they sent a very, very small piece of it, which they'd sort of scanned. And um, the, the father says he did not verify that handwriting. But um, later at the first inquest, not the inquest I was just talking about, um, the detective essentially said that they had checked it. I was present at that. Um, and I sort of took that in good faith. Um, but it's clear that, no, they didn't check it with an expert. Um, they sent a grief-stricken man 
about one line of it. Um, they also, important this, I think, um, didn't show it to Daniel's boyfriend of four years because he wasn't next of kin. So imagine not being shown the suicide notes of your partner of four years. Um, and I think that's a clear case of discrimination. Um, I think at the inquest, we heard clear evidence of stereotyping, of discrimination, um, if you don't mind. So the definition of institutional racism given at the Stephen Lawrence inquiry um, said that uh, it could be detected in attitudes and behaviours that amount to discrimination through stereotyping, thoughtlessness, ignorance and unwitting prejudice. And I think if you co-opt that as a definition of institutional homophobia, uh, the barking investigation in Stephen Port ticks every box. It, it's uh, what I also find frustrating about this is I think that it, it wasn't just I think the homophobia around what you were discussing the next of kin, mm -hmm. but I do definitely think that we need to look. Uh, the wider issue of the use of these date rape drugs, GHB, which is what Stephen Port was using uh, to kill these victims. I mean, there is... So for anyone who's, who doesn't know about these things, in the gay scene, um, a lot of people use GHB as a, a, a in very, very limited and very, very careful doses, illegally, I should say, as a, a sexual stimulant, as a way of which to... Um, basically in, in in you know in so many times in conjunction with other drugs and unfortunately as a result of how precarious it is to do that how as a result of drinking with that people are dying within the gay community as a result of the use of that drug and you know my perception when i read about this case is there was definitely you can imagine the police sort of rolling their eyes and thinking oh well there we go there's another gay person that's just died from GHB and not really wanting to look into it any more clearly as a result of the wider issue with the gay community using and abusing this drug. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? Yes. I mean, I think, you know, to be fair, had these victims have been, had they been shot or stabbed, then I'm sure the investigation would have been different. But what's disturbing to me again, through hearing all the evidence of the inquest, is how they just actively shut down anything that challenged that view that these four men had um, willingly taken a known date rape drug. And that was whether it was evidence that we, the families and friends, were presenting to them, or even the evidence of their own pathologist. So, um, you know, I... <sighs> essentially sort of doing my own investigation. I was finding things out through Gabriel's former boyfriend. He was chatting to people online. It's all quite complex. But essentially, I was emailing the investigation. I emailed them several times saying that um, I was concerned about a scene embarking of older men drugging younger men with fatal consequences and um, linking the deaths. And they received, read, and ignored those emails, no response. Um, and I had to resort to, um, I contacted Peter Tatchell. He responded with an appropriate level of concern immediately, put me onto an organization called Gallup, Pink News. They, on my behalf, went to the police. I said that I didn't trust the police to investigate this properly. And they dismissed those organizations as well, told them essentially there's nothing to see here. And then um, nine months later, Jack Taylor is murdered. Do you feel, do you feel yourself a bit guilty There's, i'm not saying you should but but do you no i understand the question um I, I feel angry that i've been left with that feeling that um was there anything more i could have done um but i know sarah who's the mother of the first victim has said that she uh, felt the same about that because she was trying to um raise things with the police but again, having sat through the inquest, I think we've all been staggered at the sort of the low quality of the detectives. And we've realized that there was nothing we could have done. You know, that they just weren't interested in investigating these cases. So I can uh, 
yeah uh, I mean, I, I I, i've got so many tweets about this you know angela saying at the moment i'm fascinated by this case how on earth the police didn't realize these deaths were connected beggars belief watching the drama it was infuriating i was shouting at the tv it's so heartbreaking did the police get prosecuted i mean do you know i mean obviously you know the you've got the standard statements haven't you you know failings and the like and we'll learn lessons but are you confident there'll be any other kind of action against the police that uh, and the officers particularly that failed on this well i mean we had an iopc investigation and an internal investigation which took years slowed everything down um the result was a total whitewash i think um none of the officers were formally disciplined um, and actually having seen them grilled, I was kind of personal, personal level, I'm not clamoring for them to be harshly punished, but I just think if, um, if you don't take action, where is the motivation for the institution to change? And the police have apologized and that does mean something. Um, but they're still saying that they see no evidence of prejudice and I understand that their core values are professionalism and integrity and courage and compassion. Uh, from personal experience, I don't feel I saw any of that. Um, but I'd love it if Commissioner Cressida Dick would prove me wrong and if she could acknowledge to the LGBT plus community that prejudice might have played a part here. I don't think that's too much to ask. I think if she can't do that, I think she should go. Um, because London is still an open and tolerant city and we don't deserve an incompetent and prejudiced police force. And just finally, what it's done, I think, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I can't now look at police cars that have been painted in pride colours. I can't look at police officers who are sort of turning up in uh, 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 pride because to me it just means nothing now i just think we don't need that what we needed was for you to actually put into practice that stuff it's really easy to paint a police car in pride colors yeah. and and you know great well done you but but when it actually came to the crutch when it really mattered it, it it you failed you failed the community that you're claiming that you want to look after and i just wonder how you feel now about things like that when you know when you see officers at pride when you see that police cars during pride month have been painted in the pride flag uh, does it make you roll your eyes and irritate you a little bit now it's really tricky christo because it's like it's not a pos positive message to put out there is it um, what we're saying but i do feel it is it's 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 what i experienced that you know, just at the ground level, they just didn't value these young men. And, you know, I'm sure there are good people in the police. Uh, Cressida Dick is herself gay, you know? Um, so I really hope that we can find some sort of positive, that this is a moment to, to find sort of positive change and you know, if anyone in the community out there needs to deal with the police and feels undervalued now, there are, the organization I just mentioned, Gallup, it's probably worth mentioning them. There are a liaison between the gay community and the police. So they're a good organization to go to. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you uh, talking to us and talking to us about Gabrielle Cavari as well and uh, those other victims, Anthony Walgate, Daniel Whitworth and Jack Taylor as well. John Pape, thank you very much.